Welcome to episode 80 of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host, Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And this week's show, we have someone that I have the utmost respect for, uh, someone who has been in this game for a very long time. Uh, I have huge admiration for people that do things consistently over a long period of time. I admire longevity, and that is exactly what Caroline Charles has done. She founded the New England Youngbloods in 1992, and 28 years later, is still going with no plans to stop, having provided opportunities for countless youngsters in Newham, which is one of the most deprived areas uh, in the country. And not only doing the community uh, grassroots aspect side of things and, you know, using basketball as a positive tool for social changes, we always hear it be spoken about, but also uh, produced elite level talent, uh, numerous uh, GB junior internationals, as well as uh, some seniors. Uh, You'll hear us uh, mention in the show uh, Evelyn Adebayo, who is now uh, currently with the GB senior women's squad um, for their upcoming Eurobasket qualifiers. So, yeah, it's like a super impressive story and uh, someone who I I just wanted to get on to hear kind of her journey, her story with the club the barriers that they've faced things they've done um and also the fact uh, that she's a huge advocate for female basketball um and kind of talking about the, the issues that female basketball uh, has in this country so it was a thoroughly enjoyable conversation uh which i think uh, you'll get a lot of value from as well before we get into the show as always gotta give a quick mention for our patreon account uh, please go and check it out patreon.com forward slash hoops fix that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash h-o-o-p-s-f-i-x There you can sign up to give us a monthly or annual contribution of as much or as little as you'd like to help us do the work that we're doing. Uh, You know, this does cost money, it does cost time, uh, and we we are coming direct to you, our audience, to help us fund it, to help us do it. So please go and check it out, uh, patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix. As always, uh, let me know what you think uh, in the comments below on YouTube. You can reach out to me on every single social media platform at hoopsfix, or if you prefer some uh, individual one-on-one interaction, you can drop me on email, sam at hoopsfix.com. I'll reply to every single one. Anyway, uh, that is enough from me. Here is this week's show with Caroline Charles. Caroline, welcome to the show. Hi, Sam. How you doing? I'm good, thank you. Uh, a few little technical issues, but we, we, we're going in the end. Um, so there is a whole load of history stuff uh, going way back uh, to get into. And the place that I always like to start is at the beginning, talking about your basketball journey. So I'd love to hear kind of like uh, what it was that first made you pick up a basketball, how you first got into this game that we all love. Okay. Um, well, I used to live in South London in um, Kennington and never seen basketball before, even though Brixton was just down the road. Didn't know nothing about Brixton then. And... Um, My stepdad died, and my mum moved us to East London into a house because we lived in a flat, and I ended up going to college at in West Ham College, which isn't there anymore. But and I met obviously met people there, and some of the people I met there were basketball players and female. So I didn't know nothing about the game. And um, one of my friends, Jennifer Brown, or she's married now, Montaniana, um, she asked me to come with her. So I went to the basketball session and I just sat down and watched these girls just running around, bouncing this ball and shooting into, into this really high hoop, which I didn't know it was called a basket at the time. And I was just sitting there watching them. And then I must have done it, must have gone there maybe three, four times. And always just sitting there watching what's going on. And then at the end, going home with my friend Jennifer and then go and mess about wherever we were going. And um, one day the coach came up to me, that's um, Alan English. And um, he said, why do you come here and sit down for two hours watching what's going on. And I goes, I don't know how to play. He goes, well, do you want to learn? And then I looked and they were were all so good. And I was thinking, I'm 16 years old. I don't know how to play these games. And some of these girls are 16, 15, 14, and they're just all over the place. I was thinking, "Mm." he goes, just bring your stuff, bring some trainers, bring a tracksuit and just come. He goes, and we'll teach you. And that's how it started. I brought my stuff the next time, went there. I was rubbish. (laughs) 
But what I was good at, I could jump. I didn't realise, but I could jump. So I was getting rebounds all the time. Sammy, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. Okay, because you've gone from my screen. Oh. Oh, I'm still here. Maybe it's minimised or something. We'll we'll carry on talking as long as as long as I've got you. The recording should be fine. So so we're good. Um, so so you're so, about yeah. Go on. Sorry. So yeah. So I, I could rebound, and basically, and I had really fast feet, and I think I had really fast feet because um, I used to run cross country, so I could go forever and ever up and down the court, and that's basically what I did was run up and down the court, get the rebound, then pass it out to somebody. Um, the scoring came much, much later. <laughs> I had to learn to shoot the ball, but that's how I started. Just well, going with my hand and sitting down. And so, what was your what was your progression from there? Obviously, you know, you ended up playing playing National League Division One, I, I believe. Kind of, um, sort of, I guess, you know, if we. I, the thing that I want to focus on, of course, we spoke about was, was really the coaching side of things and, and talking about the transition. But, you know, the, the playing stuff is always interesting just to hear the background. So when we're talking about kind of where you went from, you know, 16 to, you know, uh, into your early adulthood playing, where were you playing? Who were you playing for? And kind of uh, what was your journey like from the playing side? Well, um, I got into coaching. I don't know if it was early or late. Um, I started coaching... When um, when the teachers, Alan English and Jerry Meredith, um, decided that they weren't going to run the club anymore, or they were going to stand down, and but the girls still wanted to play, so we decided we were going to run the club, and I sort of like took on the honorary role of player coach, and then because of, because I didn't think I was as good as the rest of the girls, I put all the other girls on and I just stand around coaching, and um, then I joined the forces, I was in the army, and then, and while I was in the army, I also joined Brixton Basketball Club. So I used to travel from Guildford two nights a week down to Brixton, train, then travel back to camp, get in before lockdown, and Games on the weekend, if I wasn't on duty, I used to travel to Brixton, go to the games wherever. Jimmy used to drop us off in Brixton. If I had to get back to Guildford, I got back to Guildford. I don't know how I did, but I did go back to Guildford. And um, I wasn't coaching so much then. I was playing with Brixton. And then um, when I got a posting closer to London, Jimmy said to me, he goes... Um, Caroline, you know, there's a lot of kids in East London, you know, that need something. That time, Humph Long had um, East London Royals, and basically all the good players went to East London Royals. But there were still kids that wanted to play basketball, but they weren't good enough, or Humph, Humph's club was full already. So these kids were all surplus to su surplus, and... I just started this little thing. I was mainly focusing on girls. And um, I was running the... See, I'm trying to get it in order. I was running the Newham team because I wasn't out of the army yet, so I was just doing things here and there and everywhere. So I was running the Newham team. And Tony Garbaletto was coaching the boys. And... When um, when I came out of the army, that was around about, I don't know, just after the Falklands War, um, when I came out of the army, Tony said to me, oh, Caroline, he goes, I'm going away for a bit. Can you look after my boys? And I said, yeah, sure, sure, sure. There's me thinking Tony's going away for a holiday, two weeks. Tony never came back. <laughs> he, he'd actually got um, a coaching position somewhere else. And he'd go, but it, I just didn't understand. I didn't listen to him properly. It was my fault. And I was stuck with all these boys and my girls. And the girls were called New and Bluebirds then. So um, I had these boys and these girls, and I was just coaching them. And How old were you at this point? Oh, I must have been about 20... No, I went in the army 16, three years. 22, 23. Okay, early 20s. Yeah. And, 
okay, because a lot of the parents used to go, how old are you, Caroline? Because I look too young. <laughs> uh, how old are you? Because, like, you know, sending their little young kids with somebody that doesn't look like they're old enough to be taking their kids anyway. And I was going, I'm 23 years old, very proud of my age. And then the boys came, and I thought, okay, I'll amalgamate the boys with the girls. And obviously, the boys didn't want to be called new and bluebirds. So I gave it out to the kids and I said, right, what do you want to be called? And they came up with New and Young Bloods. I uh, always wondered where the name come from. The kids came up with it, New and Young Bloods, because everyone thinks that we're named after Robert Youngblood. <laughs> well, we had the name long before we ever knew about Robert Youngblood. Um, and the kids came up with that. And what, was kids... it, what was it about Youngblood? What did they think that it symbolised? What did it mean to them? That they were young and they were you know, the, the young bloods of, of Newham, like they were just come up and coming and they were the new things coming in. And, you know, our main aim was always to beat East London Royals. That's it. But because we were a new club, we weren't gelling yet and everything. And East London, London Royals used to beat us on a regular basis. But then Hump was very supportive and he realised that I had a lot of, good kids where I was and when he used to come down and play me he used to say like you know um don't you think that because we weren't playing as high as Humph was and Humph was going some of those kids need to be um developed so they can get into the national team so we had this sort of like um agreement that my better players went to East London Royals and because Humph and that's kudos to me, thought that I was doing a good job developing players, he'd send his players that he thought needed work to young bloods. So Robert Reed was one of those players. He came to us and he stayed with us for about two seasons. And then when he started clicking in, as I click again, started clicking in, then he went back to East London Royals because that's where he originally came from. Um, then... Um, and then we started getting better and better and better and better. And, and people, the kids used to train so hard. I mean, I had kids vomiting on the court. They trained so hard. And they, where we used to um, train was a school called Woodside. And there was like a, a hill in the, in the playground. I, you know, I spoke to Kenrick and he said, ask her about the hill on Woodside. <laughs> there you go. And they'd have to, I'd stand, uh, um, to, they'd have to run so many um, lines and then they'd have to run up the hill and then run down the hill and as they ran down the hill they had to high five me and then go and go in and do their other exercises so they couldn't get away with running up the hill because they had to come down the hill and high five me so I'd know if they hadn't gone but they always used to run up the hill anyway but yeah that was one of the things and they, it was one of the funny things because if a new kid came and he wasn't ready for the training it was basically he'd end up vomiting after the first training session wow. and all the other players would be looking at him going, mm, yeah, you're going to learn today. <laughs> <laughs> so but, what, what was it that, you know, like, like I was saying before, before we started recording, you know, the, 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 the most impressive thing for me is the fact that, you know, Newham Youngbloods was, Newham Youngbloods was established in 1992 and here we are, what, 28 years later uh, and it's still existing, you're still doing it. Like, what was the driver? Like, what is what? Well, what is the driver? What was it that motivated you that wanted to set up your own club, do your own thing? You know, do essentially, you know, doing community service in in many ways, where you know you're not profiting from it, you're not coming away lining your pockets and ending up a multi-millionaire with houses and cars and everything else. We all know how British basketball is, you know. Um, what was the driver? Like, what is the driver? I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I had no idea what I was doing when I first started. I didn't realise that this was going to come about. Like I said, I started with a bunch of girls that wanted to continue playing after our teachers had left us and we'd got too old to be playing school basketball. And and then they all went, you know, got relationships, got married and they went away and we all got our jobs. I went into the forces and it was all bitty, bitty, bitty. And we just had these kids that had nowhere to go. And... I just felt that I had the opportunity to provide them with an outlet. And if it was basketball, then it was basketball. 
and I never used to charge them any money. I think they used to play a pound sub. Um, and Joe White, who then was playing, I used to referee more than I used to coach. I used to referee a lot of Joe's games down at Haggerston, and Joe started up his team with his boys. And um, Joe talked me through a lot of the things that I should be doing with the club. Um, and when we used to play passerelle rules, I don't know if you've ever played passerelle. Um, when we used to play passerelle for rules, for people out there that didn't know passerelle rules, you had to have so many players and five went on for so many minutes in the game and then the next five went on because that time there was only 10 in the squad. <clears throat> and um, no three-point line, by the way. Um, and then in the second half, you could mix them up. So three teams used to go to a venue and used to play each other and sometimes when um, White Heat was playing at the same venue as us, because we never had no transport, Joe used to say, share our coach. So we used to travel around with Joe to a lot of the games. And um, and while we were traveling, Joe would be talking to me and telling me, like, Caroline should be doing this, you should be doing this. You've got some quite good players. They need to be doing this. You need to be doing this. And I just found it... I, like I said, I was lost at the beginning. I didn't know. I was stuck with all these boys, all these girls, and I was coaching them all myself. And um, it was good. I enjoyed myself. I'm not going to complain. But um, I did need more help, and I'm really, really appreciative of all the advice that Jimmy Rogers, Humph Long, and Joe White, all of them gone now, Um gave me while I was doing this coaching this club and I didn't know it was going to go on for this long I didn't know it was going to get this big I didn't know it was going to get this good and um, a lot of the things that I didn't do earlier on like the girls I had Susan Davis, Della, Belinda I never played them nationally because I didn't know anything about National League and my boys never played National League once again, because I didn't know about National League. But then Hans told me about National League and Joe told me about National League and we should be playing National League. And then um, we set up in Lee Valley. Um, we were playing there. And then I started getting players from... Joe White sent me his girls because he wasn't running girls, but he had girls coming down for training. So then I had um, um, some girls coming from Hackney and then my young blood girls, and then we were at Lee Valley, and then London Towers was at Lee Valley. That's when I first met Vince and that. And um, that's when we started playing National League and doing okay. We did okay. I wouldn't say we did anything spectacular. We never got to Final Fours or anything like that, but, you know, that was one of our aims. So we've, we've done the rounds, and um, then I... To help with my national, to help with the finance of National League, because I wasn't charging the kids, and that was one of my big problems. I wasn't charging the kids, so I never had any money to play National League. So then I start. Jimmy Rogers asked me to come and coach down at Brixton, um, the team down there. So I would then drive my girls from Newham. Um, so we'd finish school, get in the minibus, drive down to Brixton, do training. Then I'd drive all the Newham girls back to Newham, drop them off at their houses because it was late at night. And then and then Brixton, we did well at Brixton. We did well at that. And then Jimmy said to me, Caroline, you've got a good core of girls there and they're basically Newham based. Start doing things properly down at Newham. And that's when I started going National League. I went National League with the girls and then the boys were like, well, what about us? What about us? And then I started getting other coaches coming in. Some of the co some of the coaches that came in were coaches that had been in my girls' team previously, like Rebecca King, Emma Omabari, um, Stephen Onretti, um, trying to think of anyone else that came coaching. Kenrick had gone by then, but those those guys who had then grown too old to play juniors then came back and helped me 
coaching the kids that I had. And that's when we started gaining strength. You know, when you, you talk about your influences, you know, those three names, when we talk about Jimmy Rogers, um, Joe White and Hump Long, you know, we're talking about three of the, the most legendary coaches um, to have ever coached in this country. Uh, when you think about the influence that they and the impact they had on you and your own journey and the biggest learnings that you've taken from them and carried forward with you, whether it's on the basketball court or in life in general, what would you say uh, those learnings and those sort of takeaways are? Um, well, mm, Jimmy, Jimmy was very much, um, he encouraged me because I was a black female and I had a lot of young black kids and then times it was all Brixton riots and things like that and the kid, every time you saw the kids, everyone thought there was something going on. So Jimmy encouraged me to help the kids in Newham like he was helping the kids in Brixton. He said, you can take this model and take it to Newham, take it to East London and set it up. Um, Humph had a, a really good program and Humph showed me what you could do with a small amount of people and you can get a big result, right? Because um, Jimmy had loads. Jimmy had there was hundreds of kids all over Brixton, but Humph had a very small core of players, and but a lot of teams. But there was a very small core. He's, I don't think East London Royals was as mega as Brixton, because um, when they had games down at Brixton, the rough house was just the roof was just tearing off, um, and Joe. Joe worked with, he tried to give those disadvantaged kids in Hackney a chance, a, a light at the end of their tunnel. And it wasn't all about, they didn't have to like end up being on the streets and hustling for a living. And Joe showed them that there was other ways that you could earn a living and get somewhere and do something and be someone. So three very different coaches, three different, very different approaches in basketball, but their ultimate aim was to make the kids see that there's something out there to give you a chance to be a better you. And I wanted to do that for the kids in Newham. But then Newham became bigger. And then we had, once we started getting a name for ourselves, like um, youth games, winning at the youth games, uh, who's Newham? Usually it was... I don't know, Tower Hamlets, Humph, or Brixton, Southwark. And they were the teams that were winning. Then Newham came in and just upset the apple cart. And then people started taking notice of what was going on. And um, then we had people saying from South London saying, can we come and play for Newham Young Bloods? Well, you do realise that you're coming past a few clubs to get to us. No, we really want to play for you. And then we had kids from Essex, kids from Croydon, kids from Greenwich. Um, coming from wherever to come to us with them. It's a lot of traveling, but you know, so no, we want to play for you. Or I couldn't get into that team. So I came to this team. Well, and then we had, um, there's quite a few teams set up in Newham, in Newham now, like NASA and um, Baltic stars. Right. So there is a lot of kids playing basketball in Newham. I don't know why, but there is. There just seems to be some like concentrated core here. So those teams are now taking the overspill of kids. So we've got kids from all over the place and all of those teams as well. So there is a big, I don't know why, but there just seems to be a lot of kids. And a lot of kids from Essex coming into the city now to play for the teams now because the teams seem to be closing down in Essex. I don't understand why. When you talk about kind of, I guess, the ethos of the club and, and what you're what you're trying to, you know, let's say you've got a, you know, 11, 12 year old that says they want to start playing basketball. Um, when you're looking at them, like, of course, there is part of it about is, is about develop, developing them as a basketball player. Right. But also it's about making them fall in love with the game. And I assume, you know, teaching them life skills off the court as well. Like, how are you approaching it when you've got a, a young player that wants to start, that's come to the club and says, oh, you know, I want to get involved or whether their parents have come to you and said, oh, I want them to start playing basketball. Kind of, 
what's your approach when you're thinking about how you need to, um, I guess, deal and start coaching that 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 young player? Well, um, well, they come and basically um, we have to look and see. It's um, I've got this saying. I, I wonder. I think I got it from Mark Dunning. Thinking, thinking, but somebody said it about knowing your cats, right? And for me, knowing your cats, as in, <clears throat> is this person a tiger, a lion, a pussycat, a cheetah, a puma, right? And some of the kids will come with you and they've got the bravado, like, yeah, I want to play basketball. And then some of the parents will go, oh, I've got a 12 year old kid and he's six foot already. Yeah, bring him, bring him, bring him. And some of the kids will come and they're really timid. And we just let them play. Like, you know, just go over there, grab a ball, just run with the other kids. And then something like, oh, I don't really want to play. And we just want to see how much they want to play the game. And sometimes we just leave them, leave them, and let them just run with the kids and see how they fit in. Because they've got to be comfortable. It's no use me saying, all right, I want you to go over there and shoot some free throws. And the kid doesn't know what's going on. They don't know how to shoot. So we just let them run up and down. And then as they're playing... We say, right, if you do this, then that will make that movement better. And it's just little, just putting in little bits. It's like um, cooking a meal and putting a bit of spice in and putting some um, onion in and then some garlic and, uh, you know, and some butter and just mixing it up. And that's what it is. We're just adding on to what they already bring to us. Some kids will come and you don't have to add too much. And some kids will come and then you've got to basically start from the beginning and just put all the ingredients down and then mix it up to make a meal. And some kids you don't have to work too hard with. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a kid come to us. Uh, he's just gone to America now, Sultan Adewale. And Sultan came to us and he had basically everything. He had height. He was very athletic, but he doubted himself. So we brought him in. Oh, he could dunk. He could dunk. And that was his forte. So we we didn't try to stop him from dunking, but we said to him, there's more to basketball than just dunking. So here, here's a little ingredient here. Now we want you to be able to control the ball on the dribble. Okay, then. And then when you can dribble, you can do your layup. And if it's a free lane, you can do your dunk. And then we, then as he started getting better and people started looking at him and thinking, okay, this kid's 14 years old. He's six foot something, right? He can dunk the ball, right? We're interested in him, Caroline. Send him to us. Right? Can he shoot? Okay, so we go back, right? Re take away that bit and it's right. we want you to start shooting now so we're still going to keep with the dribbling and now we're going to work on your shooting so we're just adding on all the time you just get the kid and just adding on all the time and the good players will tell you they're always learning and that's what we always tell the kids yeah you can shoot but that doesn't mean that's all you're going to rely on you've got to learn to do other things mm. right so that's that's my approach always be adding on that they're, they're, they're never the finished article never all right you always got to keep adding on adding on and now that he's gone to america one of the last things i said to him before he got on the plane was don't forget you're not finished yet you haven't done it all yet okay you still got to add bits into your pie so yeah that was quite that was quite emotional saying goodbye to him i must admit when, when you talk about the the current club structure uh you know how, what's the sort of the spread of you know the teams that you have boys girls the age groups that you go down to like kind of what does it look like at the moment um at the moment um because of covid we've um we were training on the outside playground. But at the moment, we have under-14 Prem, under-16 Conference, under-16 Prem, under-16 Girls Prem, and under-18 Prem. So we've got five teams this season. Last season, we had 
under 14 conference, under 14 prem, under 16 conference, under 16 prem, under 18 conference, which we weren't happy about because we wanted them to go prem because the under 18 conference were the under 16 prems that were too old and had won their league and battered everybody, but BE wouldn't let us go into the prem because it was a new team coming in. So a bit of politics there. So we went into the conference and it wasn't very stimulating for the boys. Yeah. Right? They needed to be challenged more. And now they've got Prem and we haven't got any basketball this week. So, ah! Nightmare, isn't it? So when when you talk about uh you know going up to, to 18s, have you be have you ever considered uh wanting to, you know, set up your own academy, you know, uh and then keep the kids for until under 19 level have that whole kind of set up or for you has it always been very much you want to you prefer to kind of keep it as the, the separate club structure um and be able to focus on sort of i guess the what the club community side of things mm. all right then no i haven't really thought about going to the academy um because i think that you then go under a regime with the academy. And I don't, I'm not saying that in a negative way. You know, things have to be done a certain way because you're accountable in the academy. Whereas with my club, um, the buck stops at me. When things go wrong, Basketball England always notifies me. You know, Caroline, this happened. What have you got to say about it? Or this is happening. What are you going to do about it? So... Um, and there's still kids out there that will never be academy kids, but they want to play basketball because they love basketball. And I want to be there for those kids. I also want to be there for those kids that want to take it further because we're quite proud of the amount of kids we've sent to the States and that have played for the national team. But, um, I'm also proud of the kids that never got to play, go to the States or play for the national team, but they have a love. And when we were, when basketball was running and we had a scrimmage, those same kids that didn't play national for the national team and didn't go to an academy would turn up for a scrimmage. Hey coach, how coach, how's it going? What are you doing now? Oh, I do this, I do that. You know, um, I've got one of my girls who runs a fitness program. Um, one of my girls is trying to get her records released. Uh, Big shout out for Incrabelle, um, Chantel. Um, and, you know, everybody, they've all walks of life that's going on, but they are my basketball family, but they're not my national players and they're not my um, academy players, but they have a love for the game. So, yes, I want to stay with the community. You know, when we talk about Newham, uh, you know, it is one of the most deprived boroughs in the country. Um we always hear this sort of narrative about uh, basketball as a as a tool, as a social tool to keep kids off the street, keep them out of trouble. Um, you know, do you feel like, you know, working in Newham for 30 odd years as you have with basketball, do you feel like that is the case uh, in terms of what your club has offered? Do you think it has kept a lot of kids out of trouble? Do you, do you, do you see the social impact? Do you feel the social, social impact in your community? Yes. Yes. So uh, I, Undoubtedly, the kids, um, they have some focus, they have some, they have life skills. They understand that there's other things just than being on the street. And also the parents feel safe, that they know where their children are um, for two nights a week. Because the way things are with, you know, postcodes and county lines and all those things the kids haven't got time to be involved in that because they're at training and if they're not at training they're at games so two nights a week they're at training then the weekend they're away to games and when you think of it, it's two hours for a game if you're traveling away let's say we're going to Solent Solent's a two-hour trip so that's two hours to get there you've got to get there an hour before tip so let's say that's three hours, then two hours for the game, that's five hours, then two hours back, that's seven hours. That's basically the day gone. Where, what, where are they going to go? What are they going to do? They're tired by they come back. They just want to go home and go to sleep. So the parents are happy with that. 
and and uh, all our all our staff are trained up child protection first aid so the parents are happy that they know that their kids are with somebody that will keep their child safe so, yes i think that um we i'm thinking back now all the way down and we've had kids that have come from um bad backgrounds i mean i remember one kid that actually had um same things around his ankle oh like a strap so that they can like a um i know i know what you mean yeah yes yeah, so, yeah we had one kid that we he, he had a tag a tag right? yeah he got in trouble he got in trouble not with us but he got in trouble and he had a tag because we had to take him by game to game and he had to be back in Newham by a certain time. Right. And he, he was, he was a lovely kid. I don't know what he did to get in trouble, but he was a lovely kid. And like, and his mum used to let him come to the game. Cause she said, I'd, I'd rather him be with you than be open to his friends coming around and taking him out and getting him in more trouble. But um, yeah, but he was about the only kid I knew that was at our club that had, had been in trouble. The rest of the kids, I don't know anyone that's been in trouble. Mm-hmm. And they haven't had the opportunity. Um, you know, silly little things like if we're going on the train, we, we would say to them, make sure you got your ticket because we don't want to get pulled over on the, tra- on the train by the ticket collectors. So all those sort of things like, no, you can't. No, you've got to pay your fare. No, we've got to do this. We've got to do that. Just those little skills that we're saying. Don't be sliding down the escalator bar. Right? Don't be sliding down there because you never know where the transport police are and you're just going to get yourself in silly little things that can get you in trouble. So we, we're we always reiterating those things to keep the kids on the straight and narrow and, you know, drug testing. You know, our kids don't do drugs. Because we're always telling them when we go to games, you're open to a drug test. We frighten the life out of them. We tell them stuff that sometimes isn't even true. Um, (laughs) I remember one time when I was coaching um, Barkin and Dagnum, um, women's team, and Sadie was one of my was one of my point guards, Sadie Mason, and she was Sadie Edwards then. And um, I didn't even realise about that, but they told us that after the game, we played. Sheffield Hatters, right? And um, after the game, I had to, they I had to nominate three numbers at the beginning of the game, and at the end of the game, straight away they couldn't come to the change room. They had to go and have um, a drug okay. test, right? So they'd already told us this pre-game. So I was like, all right, make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure you're all clean. We don't want any problems because I don't know what three numbers are going to get selected. So you guys have to make sure that you're all good. I was going, why are you saying that to Carol? I said, just in case, just in case, just, just making sure. I said, I don't know what you guys do, but just make sure, just letting you know, pre-warning you. But uh, those were women then. I mean, I, I haven't got that problem with the kids and we've been with the final fours and, you know, and we help them with their exams and things like that. So we try so hard to make sure that the the narrative is stay on the straight and narrow. Yeah. The other big thing that has obviously happened in in Newham um, in the in the time that you've been running the club is the London 2012 Olympics. Uh, yeah. And you know the, the the buzzword in the run up to the Olympics and something we we heard for many years afterwards was the legacy. Uh, you know, I've got my own very strongly held opinions about that. But, you know, as someone that is on the ground, that is one of those clubs that is operating in the borough that the Olympics happened. Um, can you talk about sort of your thoughts on the legacy, the basketball legacy from the Olympics, whether you feel um, that it has had any sort of tangible impact on sort of, I guess, grassroots basketball and basketball in, in the area? During 2012 and the lead up to 2012, um, Newham was the hotspot, and anything that we wanted, we were getting. After 2012, when the Olympic packed up and went, everything else packed up and went as well. As you know, the the stuff that was built there, we can't afford to um, use their courts. Um, the sporting facilities, it's too expensive for 
local teams. You've got to have a bit of money behind you. Like it's um, Stratford's become very gentrified now. So the people that are living there have the money to go into the centres that they're just their schools and Chobham is quite an expensive court to get onto. The facilities they have around the Olympic Village, the facilities are quite expensive to get onto. I mean, <clears throat> um, Bobby Moore, we used Bobby Moore for a while and we're grateful to Bobby Moore um, School. But um, other than that, it's basically a no-no. It's um, really hard to find anywhere in Newham that it's not so expensive that it takes our club, takes a lot of money out of our club. Um, we don't charge the children a lot of money. So if we, let's say, right, what we charge the children now, and if we had to pay for a whole season of the court, for court hire, we wouldn't have any money. We'd be in the red. We'd be in the red. And um, so, yes, um, before anyone says anything, yes, I know there's grants available and we would be applying for the grants, but um, it shouldn't be that like that. It's um, where we're, we're a very successful team. We're in the borough that had the Olympics in it. We should be able to get into a venue. And I'm not saying not pay for it. Of course, we've got to pay for it. You've got to pay for the work that other people are doing there. But... The money we'd have to charge children lots of money to cover the cost of the courts. Yeah. All right. And um it's we're a volunteer group and we're so busy developing the kids that we have got um parents that are helping with the volunteering, um with the admin of the club. So that's a good thing. But um it is it is a big slog trying to get a grant to cover getting a court to play mm. on. Like right now, because of COVID, we can't use the school that we usually use, um, St Bonaventures, who have helped us in very tight spots. Um, but we understand about the COVID and why we can't use the court. And they let us use the playground, but now it's getting dark. We can't use the playground, so we had to go inside. And just as we managed to sort out an indoor venue, we then had lockdown again, and all the leisure centres got closed down. So we're back to mm. we're back to now. We're even worse off now because we haven't got the playground. It's too dark, and we can't train at all now. Wow. So, um, in in so, the in the run up to London 2012, uh, did you feel like that a lot you were you would you feel like there were any sort of false promises made or, or not even necessarily, it wasn't necessarily promi promises but maybe people saying to you oh you know the olympics are coming we can do this we can do that like i know from from my own personal perspective so i went full-time on hoops fix well full-time freelancing basketball stuff leaving my job in 2012 because in the run-up to it all of a sudden there was just money floating around that would, there never was before. Like there were brands that were they're getting involved. Adidas were doing things. Nike was doing things. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, like this is actually, this could work. And of course, what happened for me, I quit my job. Olympics came. It was great. And then when it went, exactly like you said, all the brand money left with it as well. And then I was just like, oh no, I've got no money. And I'm in a situation where I've quit my job. Uh, and I feel like it, it could potentially be the same for, you know, a basketball club like yours, where it's like, you know, in the run up to it, you're being told that this is what's going to happen. There's going to be a legacy. You're going to get this facility. You're going to get subsidies on this. You're going to get basketballs or hoops or whatever it might be. Kind of like, what was the chat in the run up to 2012, whether you were speaking to Newham Council, whether you were speaking to um, people from LOCOG, the, the, the Olympic Organising Committee, like kind of what was the the build up to the Olympics? What were people saying to you as the as the owner of the Newham Youngbloods? Well, Basically, what you were saying, like, yeah, money was going to be coming in, you'd be able to use this facility, you'd be able to use that facility, you'd be able to do this, we're going to back you on this. And um, Newham Council did help out for a while, but um, when the money ran out with to them, then obviously they couldn't then help us. So I wouldn't say there was false promises there, but because they did help us, for quite a bit but um but once the money ran out that was it you know mm. we left to fend for ourselves i mean i still keep in contact with new council and they do try and help us 
as much as they can. But financially, they haven't got no money to help us, so we can't really ask them for any money. But on the twist of that, um, they have helped individual kids. We've gone to them and said, look, this kid is um, going to play for England and we can do individual grants and get money for them. So they have helped us there. So I won't say that they promised us the world and didn't give us because they helped us as much as they could, as much as humanly possible. But um, yes, I was a bit disappointed because I love 2012. That's one of my best years. And uh, I don't know if you know that I was linked with getting the Olympic bid and I was part of, part of the program that went over and we went over to Singapore and with David Beckham and Daley Thompson and the whole entourage that went over there and all the kids and they had to wave and um, that so was what, one. So what was that? Was that they were like trying to? They were saying that you were one of the local clubs that were going to benefit from the Olympics. That's kind of worked in Newham. Like kind of what was your? How were? You, why were you involved? What was the? What was the context? Oh, well, I didn't. Hmm. The context was. Oh gosh, this. Wow. Okay, then going back. Okay, they wanted some. They they were going to go into it as in. We of the young generation, we're going to have this legacy that is going to be there for the young people. So their whole remit was to bring young people over to Singapore with the Olympic bid saying, these are the kids, all these kids that are going to benefit from the Olympics being in London 2012. So we went over there with, um, um, when we brought the bid over, they sent it over with a young person and they approached Newham Council and I said, can you recommend, I wasn't involved in this, all right, please note, I was not involved in this, can you recommend a young person who epitomises sport in Newham? And they gave a few names and one of the names happened to be my daughter, all right, and they selected my daughter and my daughter then went over to, I can't remember where we went, Switzerland. Went to Switzerland and we put in the Olympic bid and it was accepted and then that's how we got to go to Singapore. Wow. So then when we got to go to Singapore, because my daughter had gone over as the main person, the face of the 2012, um, they then added on top of that and they brought in all these kids from all over East London and they shipped us all off to Singapore. And I went over as a um, chaperone. So it wasn't anything to do with basketball. My daughter was basketball, yeah. but I went as a chaperone. And um, it, it was great. It was absolutely fantastic. And as you know, we won the bid. It was fantastic. And people were throwing us all over the place. And so when I came over, I worked um, in the Olympic City. But... Um, that 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 was the mix up of everything. So it was it was a great time. Twenty twelve was a great time, and I thought that it would be great afterwards. And I'm got to admit, I mean, when I walk around Stratford and I see all the buildings and great memories come back, but then I look and I think, well, what's now? It's still not what we hoped it would be. It's not local sport in there. There's not a lot of local sport happening. There's people coming in and using the facilities, but the local people aren't using. I might be wrong, but it's not what I'm seeing. Mm. I mean, we when I'm coming from Bobby Moore after training, going around, you walk past the swimming place, um, you walk past the cycle track, and we don't see a lot of local kids on it. Yeah, yeah. No, I might be wrong. I might be wrong. And I think it's well, it's a f the the gentrification thing is a is a familiar issue in 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 London, isn't it? And I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, Stratford is has clearly, like I said, I've I've lived it. I moved to I moved to Plaster in two thousand and eleven uh, because I knew at that point I knew that I was going to get media accreditation to the Olympics. And I don't know if you TFL was scaremongering so much about the fact that public transport is going to be not be working because there's going to be so many people. So people need to find alternative routes. People need to work from home. So I was like, I want to be walking distance to the Olympic Park so that if public transport is messed up, I can do it. And then 
yeah, so I've kind of seen the transformation uh, over the years and, and been on the ground myself. And yeah, like for sure, it's, you know, I think, uh, you know, you come into you come into Stratford and you walk around the uh, Westfield and, and, and the uh, sort of East Village behind it and everything else. It's, it's completely different. And I would say for sure, it's um, not necessarily the, the, the locals who lived here before that have benefited from that. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested, like kind of, kind of talking about the the resource that the club had in in the in the run up to 2012 and then it and then it going away like if you were to look at the club now and you were to look at what um is potentially holding it back like if you were to, if i was to give you a blank check and say you know use this to grow the club you know to to make it whatever you want it to be like what do you think like is it just money or is there other things like when you talk about kind of like what what would really the biggest barriers that's helping that's stopping Newham Young Lives from being even bigger and more successful than it already has been? Venue and venue equals money, right? If I had a venue, if like um, Lewis and Thunder, if I had the venue that Lewis and Thunder had, I'd be happy. I, I wouldn't even work. I'd just run that venue, rent it out to some other clubs as well. So they come in, and that would be my revenue. All right, just basketball lines, no badminton court, never, never, never. <laughs> maybe put some volleyball in there so volleyball can come in because volleyball doesn't get a good look at things either. But, um, <laughs> I like volleyball. But um, <clears throat> yes, a venue. If I could get a warehouse and transform it into a basketball court and basically run ourselves and obviously allow other um, teams to come in there and train but we'd have our own facility for games and for training and that blank check would would basically provide us with a venue and I don't know um, I think the kids should still be able to pay a membership because so that they understand that you don't get something for nothing all right, that's why we charge the kids membership. And that was one of the things that Humph told me, that the kids have to understand that you don't get something for nothing. Um, but um, so I agree with membership being paid, but I don't agree with milking the money out of the kids. I mean, there's some clubs out there that charge an astronomical amount of money for membership. And then... I quite happily, when I know, when we're going somewhere that I know pays a lot of money for membership, I get my kids, I go, ask that kid how much they pay for membership. And when they hear that, coach, I go, yeah, so don't ever moan about how much we charge you. Money is a big ask Mm -hmm. to keep your club running. And how we do it, I don't know. Um, Two years ago, um, the two male coaches, um, Paul Edwards and Stephen Onoretti, um, they put a new look on it because they were saying that um, I hadn't put the money up for membership since they were kids and now they were there coaching and that we needed basically to put the money up to keep the club running. And plus we were doing so well. So we had extra expenditure as in, traveling when we got to the final fours we had to go to the playoffs and sometimes you had to travel up north and then if we got far enough in the final fours then we had to go to manchester stay in the hotel so we had to then allow for that sort of money so when they put that in place um it did bring in more revenue and applying for grants um go fund me so every year i was doing go and fund me um, London Lions allow us to go in. I'm sure you've been there where we've been walking around with buckets and collecting money up to go to um, the final fours. So money, yeah, money. That blank check would be money to get a venue. And you, you mentioned it. There, I was going to say, you know, you, you announced uh, this partnership with with London Lions a, f- uh, a few years ago now. Like, kind of, what, what tangibly did that mean for the club? What does it? What did it change? Does does it change anything? Like, what, what does it mean? Like, what what is the partnership? Uh, you know, having a having a link with with a BBL club. Well, there's good and there's bad. Um, it's good as in the kids are totally stoked. Oh yeah, we're a part of London Lions, All right? So they like the kudos of that. So they can go around saying, yeah, we're part of London Lions. And 
they get to go and see the games, the home games. They get to see the uh, an arena atmosphere other than what they'd see on TV watching the NBA. They actually get to go and watch a game and see the atmosphere of a, a big game with a lot of people watching rather than um, at St. Bonaventure's. Bon- bon- I think the most we've ever had in there is about 100 for a playoff game. Um, so when they go and watch Thunder Lions, um, they like triple that amount of people, if not more. Um, and then the negatives are um, that because people see that we're with London Lions, they think that we're a rich club mm. and um, they don't think we need anything. So when we are asking for things, they're thinking, why do you need to ask for anything? You're part of London Lions. But um, London Lions have to cover their own expenditures and... Um, you know, it's good that when we get to the final fours and do, and we get players getting into the England team, but um, we can't expect London Lions to cover everything. They do help out, but they don't cover everything. And um, we have to, well, we don't have to take that back. We don't have to, but we want to help the kids and not see their parents struggle. Because, you know, some kids will say, oh, well, I'm not going to go to that. And then when you sort of like corner them and go, why are you going? You know, it's an opportunity for life. And they go, my mum hasn't got enough money or we haven't got enough money. And like, I'll just, just go, just go. We'll help you. Don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. We'll sort it out. So um, th- that's the, the pros and cons. The pros, right, it's good kudos for us. Yeah. And the cons is people then get preconceived ideas about what is actually happening in our club. Do the, do, the, do, the, do, the, do the Lions put in resource into the club? Do they help out financially or, or give you other resource like that? And they give us kit and access to um, their courts for training. Um, they offered us the, to be able to play before the London Lions play. So we get that exposure there. Yeah. And also for our um, more talented players to come and train with the men's team. So uh, I don't know about money as in physical money, yeah. no. But, um, but as in we didn't, for a couple of years, we didn't have to buy a kit. Yeah, yeah, value and kind stuff. The... Um... Yeah. Oh yeah, we obviously saw this summer that uh, you know the Lions came under new ownership. Um, you know, a big American sort of VC firm with a lot of money have started funding funding them. Has that changed anything for you in terms of your partnership? Have you noticed anything uh, in terms of the resource that you get, or has it been very much the same still? Um, yeah, um, yeah, it's a bit better now. Okay, because mostly because they got more money to splash around. Um, it's a bit better now, but um, I did. We last year we got the kids all new kit, and um, one of the things was we we was going to get kit again, and that was on the offer, and we actually refused the kit because all the kids had their own kit with their names on it and everything, and we didn't want them to go through another change of kit as well. So that was on the offer. Um, we've um, We've been offered help with coaching and we've been offered help with training facilities again. But London Lions are also struggling to find venues for them to train in. So obviously the men's team takes priority other than the junior team. Mm -hmm. So it's worked out now because um, they were trying to help us to find a venue. Um, giving us names of where they were training and what they thought was available. But because of the lockdown now, I can't really say that we've had anything else. And I can't blame London Lions for that either because of the situation that the whole of the country's in. So um, um, it has got better. It has got better, as in stuff that they've been giving to us and helping us. 
one of the other things that that uh you know i definitely want to talk about is just female basketball in general um in in london in the uk like we know it's something that is particularly uh, close to your heart of course that was the foundations of of the club originally and obviously now you sprang out into doing boys as well but of course you know you, you're known for for getting females a lot of females playing basketball um you know when you talk about sort of the state of of female basketball in england Kind of, what would you say about it? You know, we know you travel around and you play in National League at various different age groups, so you kind of see a lot of it at a grassroots level. Kind of, what would be your assessment of kind of where it's at, um, what the issues are, if you see any major issues, uh, yeah, and how you would evaluate it? There's a lot of coaches out there that um, are trying to push to get more females into basketball. But um, <sighs> me, social media and... The girls themselves, it's really hard to get girls to come in fully like the boys come in. And also, it's not pushed enough by the powers that be. So it's not... Um, right, for example, okay, I won't say, let's not talk about basketball for a minute. Let's talk about football. Okay, um, lockdown now. The Premier Elite boys can play football. But the Premier Elite girls can't play football. Why? All right. So those sort of things then make the girls look and oh, well, it's not worth it. I'll go and get my nails done and get my hair done. All right. Because there's nothing for them. And right now, um, I'm struggling. I've, um, I've had to start up a new under-16 team and I've got the girls, but now we've got nowhere to play and I'm trying to keep them together but there's no onus on them to come back. I mean, they will come back because I'm in contact with them, but there has to be somewhere for them to go. There has to be a light at the end of the tunnel. And right now, and I know it's no one's fault, so I'm not blaming anyone, but right now the situation that the country's in is having a very detrimental effect on females and sport. Because we are the underlings of sport anyway, all right, and then trying to trying to get them back after lockdown is going to be hard for some places. And already um, before lockdown even started, there was teams dropping out of the league because the numbers weren't coming because of all the lockdown that happened before we came back in September and people didn't have the numbers in September. And they're saying, we can't run the club because we haven't got enough players. Right? Fortunately for me, even though I had a turnover of players and a lot of my players left to go under 18s to go academy. All right, I then had an influx of girls um, coming into the club, and I've got 15 girls. But how long am I going to keep 15 girls if we haven't got any games to play? Mm. The last thing we did was we played a friendly game at the week before lockdown. So we was getting ready to start the season the 7th of November, and then lockdown came. And they goes, well, we had our last training session. I goes, right, girls, there won't be any more training sessions because of lockdown. They go, does that mean we're not playing the game then? I said, yeah, no game. And they're like, oh, you know, so now I've got to make sure that I do things to keep their interest, right, and keep them invested so that when lockdown is finished in December, that we come back and we're back to training like we were. But when are we going to start playing games? Don't know if they're going to have a season. Yeah, well, like of course, you know, COVID has has caused massive problems. But even even pre-COVID, you know, my sense was that, uh, you know, female basketball in particular has always struggled with just the numbers. Like it's just getting a team of twelve girls, you know, wherever you are. Um, why, like, why do you think that is? Why do you think uh, there are, you know, when you compare it to males, why is, uh, are, th- are there fewer females playing basketball? Um, and why do you think, you know, in Newham? with the young bloods, you've kind of been able to overcome that. And, I, well, you know, having numbers has never really been a problem as, as far as I'm aware. Like, what is it that you're doing differently to, to attract girls into, uh, into basketball? Um, well, we start them young. So I tried to get into primary schools and um, ping their interest in primary school. And then from primary school, then try and get them to come to club. It's building confidence because a lot of the girls don't feel confident in themselves um, when they're playing. Um, I've got a six foot seven girl. Uh, when she came to us, she was 14 years old. 
and basically she must have been told over the years you know be gentle you're too big you're bigger than everyone else and, and she came in and basically she was all crouched up and half herself and she had no confidence whatsoever and I had to like trail her around wherever I knew there were tall girls and girls that were playing well and take her and show her, look, there are other females like you playing. Look, she's got makeup on, but she's playing basketball. She's got her hair done, but she's playing basketball. She doesn't look like a boy. She's not full of muscles. And these are all the things that I hear the girls saying, oh, I don't want to get muscles. Oh, I don't want to break my nails. Oh, I don't want to do this. Oh, I don't want to do that. Um, so the girls have got this thing that they don't want to be looked at as doing something boyish, right? And um, and also, there's also the basketball happens in the winter months and the parents don't want their girls out on the street at night. Um, and girls are more studious, so their parents would rather they study than, as some of them say, bounce the ball. I used to have one girl, um, Evelyn Adebayo, and her parents were adamant that she was going to become a doctor and bouncing the ball wasn't going to get her anywhere, but it did. And she went over to the States, got a full scholarship, ended up playing at a high um, university and I think she's in Belgium now yeah exactly she was at, she went to, finished off a finished off a college career at UConn and has, has just got a GB senior call up and she's with the women at the moment right so that's what I'm saying so and like I had to basically beg her mum to let her play and because her mum wasn't sort of like more about her getting her education I had to chase Evelyn around the school to get to come training I, I mean, she's, she was six foot something she's trying to hide from me in school I see you <laughs> get into the gym mm. I, but, um, but um, so you know, if, you, if you were trying to implement a you know like we've seen Barcelona England have, have made a point of trying to focus on it with this all girls uh, stuff that they they announced all girls program trying to just I guess raise awareness of it and increase increase participation on the female side like, do you think that that's made any tangible difference? And I guess if you were if you were trying to come up with some type of strategy, like a nationwide strategy to increase female basketball participation, um, what would you be looking at trying to do as a priority? Primary schools, getting into the primary schools first and doing things for the girls. The boys will always have something going, but make it especially girls training for the girls and they come to it. Like, look how many girls turn up for gymnastics. All right, because it's a girl thing, all right? They're all there and they're all in their little leotards running up and down and jumping up and down. And the training that gymnasts do is so hard, all right? But they make it look girly and pretty. And I, does this sound too genderish? Because um, I don't mean that basketball girls had to be girlish and pretty, but it has to be appealing to the girls where they don't feel that they're being made to be do boy boyish things. Yeah. All right. And I always say, like, p people say, oh, girls basketball. So there's no such thing as girls basketball. There's there's girls who play basketball. All right. But there's not girls basketball. There's it's not a different thing. Girls basketball, boys basketball. It's not a different thing. It's the same sport played by different genders. So yes, I would get into the primary schools first. All right, so the parents get happy with it, that their kids running around, getting fit, enjoying playing sport, and it's a team thing, and they've got that little family atmosphere going on. And then you bring them up slowly with the mini basketball, the under 12. When we used to go to mini basketball festivals, there was girls all over the place. And then you, and then as a few years on, and if where, where have all those girls gone? All right, and somehow they get lost in the melee. And then when you go into the primary schools, make sure there is a club for them to go to because that's where they get lost in the melee. There's loads of them and then there's no way for them to go or no easy access for them to go or the club that they have to go to is miles and miles away and some parents work late so they can't get their kids to that venue 
or some parents haven't got a car so they can't get their kids to that venue so you have to give them access because there's little pots of clubs all over the place but they haven't got a girls team why haven't you got a girls team oh I can't coach girls why can't you coach girls you can coach boys you can coach girls they're the same right so it it's a lot primary school definitely and then make sure that they have that pathway into a club from the primary schools into a club and I think that's why it's successful in Newham because you've got primary school basketball and then you've got um the the other club NASA and you've got us that the girls can go into and then we get kids from Waltham Forest and um, Redbridge coming to us because there's nothing there in their boroughs. I was going to say, like in the you know in the time you've been running the Young Bloods, you've seen other clubs come uh, come in and get involved. Like, do you feel like Newham could support more clubs? Do you think there needs to be more clubs, or do you think that uh, having more clubs causes more issues than it does benefits? I don't think Newham needs any more clubs. We've got NASA. Baltic Stars and us. I know someone else is going to say when they hear this, oh, you didn't kill us, Caroline. I go, so I'm thinking that's it in Newham. And then you've got Frenford in Redbridge, Frenford Falcons. Um, I'm now stretching out. There's, is there anything in Tower Hamlets? Oh, you've got, um, yes, there is something in Tower Hamlets. I can't remember what they're called, but there is something in Tower Hamlets. Then you've got a team in, in Hackney. I think it's Hackney Lions. Um, so I'm, I'm, but do, I'm, do you think that is enough? Like, do you think there is more appetite for it than clubs, or do you think there's there's too many clubs and not enough players? Like, do, Yeah. But the thing is, these clubs that I'm talking about haven't got girls' programmes. That yeah. We're... I'm thinking, we're, out of all those clubs I've mentioned, we're the only girls' programme. Right. Um, there was Eastside Eagles, and I think Barking now has a club. I think, I think. I'm not sure, because I've been trying to sort my club out. But I think Barking Abbey might have a club. Might. Mm. I'm guessing. I don't, know, I don't know. But I'm just saying that I've just named at least 10 clubs. But out of those 10 clubs, Barking would, would definitely have a women's team, if, if that is, if they are what I think, if I think it, if it is who I think it is, they'll definitely have a women's team. Eastside Eagles, I don't know if they're still running a girls program. And us. Yeah. And I'm not sure if NASA's running a girls program. I know they... Might be, but I don't know if they've got enough girls. So, out of those ten, three. Yeah, it's almost just like female basketball isn't isn't a focus, is it? That's no. that's almost what it comes down to. Um, it's girls as well, it's getting the girls to actually come out of their house and come to training. Yeah, if they don't come training, then you can't run, you can't do anything. So I'm not um, slating those clubs because most probably they they want to do something with yeah. girls. But they haven't got enough girls coming in. It's a chicken. Uh, it's a chicken and egg situation, isn't it? It's yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so I'm aware. I'm aware of time. So I've got some some quicker fire, shorter questions just to to finish off with. Um, starting with, uh, what is your your personal favourite memory uh, of being involved with basketball? That can be involved from your playing days or or coaching. Playing days. Uh... Mm. Playing at Brixton Top Cats. Playing at Brixton Top Cats. I love um, every, the camaraderie, the family, the atmosphere, Freddie on the music, everybody cheering in the crowd, all the little heckles we had. Um, have you ever been to a Brixton game? Uh, yeah, but not in that era. All right, well, the Rough House. You know, those were the days that, that that was good. So that's one of my memories that I'll always have and love to Jimmy Rogers. Um, coaching, winning the girls' championships. We won that last year, the girls' cup, because 
you know, as much as I've been running the teams, my girls have always sort of like always been there on the edge, but never won a championship, even though we were quality. But we won the championship last year. And what age group was that? Worked hard for that. Which age group was that? Uh, under sixteens. Under sixteens. Um, what I is? Because I had a lot of younger girls in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, long. Okay, under sixteens. Uh, the best player that Newham Youngbloods has produced. Oh well, that's debatable, isn't it? Okay. Uh, girl or boy? Either or. <laughs> like if you were if you were to if you were to pick one as the sort of the the shiny example of. I don't know whether it's the highest level they've reached or, or whatever. Like, who who would you choose? Shanice Norton. Okay, nice. Shanice Norton. Um, I don't know if you know her. Yeah, she, of course. Yeah, she's playing at Barking Abbey now. Um, she was with me from... She must have been about nine years old. Her brother brought her, Dominic brought her down. And she used to play volleyball. But then she started playing basketball. And then she went on from... You know, she just blew up and just went away at business and she's done good. And we've always been in contact, no matter where she was, she's always been in contact with me. Um, best boy. Jelani Watson girl. MVP of the first under 16 Who's Fix All-Star Classic. Yep, there you go. And ju- the reason why Jelani, um, because... We tried to get him in the England team and the England team wasn't interested in him for whatever reason. And we went down to final fours and he decimated everybody. And um, one of the Basketball England people came up to me and goes, oh, oh, that kid over there, is he in the England programme? Why isn't he in the England programme? I said, they don't want him. And then lo and behold, he ended up in the England programme. Um but then he got his place over in the States. And the interesting thing about Jelani is Jelani was a footballer. So when he first started with us, he I think he was with Leighton Orient. And he couldn't play basketball games on certain days because he had a football match. So he wasn't wholeheartedly with us. And then he just started, like I said, we started making the pie, putting the ingredients in, and slowly but surely, as his parents called it, he came over to the dark side, basketball, and he dropped the football and took out the basketball, and he's doing well out in the States now. So sorry for anyone else who thinks, oh, she didn't mention me, but I'm happy to say there's so many kids that I could mention, but those are the sort of like standout, stories that yeah. nobody thought they would do that well and they went from rags to riches if you want to put it that way the best coach that either you've played for or you've been around coached with worked with like who would it be and why <laughs> okay it's easy it's easy and i'm sorry to everyone else but bless him he's dead as well oh brandy Bazzani. Do you know what? Brandy did my level two basketball coaching course. There you go. Brandy Fazlani. Caroline. He he should have been on my list of mentors as well. Brandy basically bottle fed me through everything. And he was based at Lee Valley. And he's yeah, he's one of the reasons why I, I started the club up there as well. He was based at Lee Valley. And when I was doing my coach two, because that time doing your coach two was a long thing. Uh, and you had to do it over a year or two, a year, and you had to fill in all this paperwork and do that. So I'd always go to him and he'd read my paperwork and goes, well, why didn't you do this? And why did you do this? And you should be doing this. So um, Branny Spoon fed me for um, coming, get my coaching qualification. And he's always had these little things that he'd say to me that um, make me smile when I think about him. But yeah. Yeah, Brandy Bazzani, he's the best coach. I'm sorry for anyone else that might be upset about it, but Brandy Bazzani, yeah. If you were to give uh, one piece of advice for someone that wanted to set up a community club and grow it and have as much success as you've had, what advice would you give to them? Don't do it for money. 
right? Because if you do it for money, then there's no love there. Um, I think what keeps my kids, and I call them my kids, is I do it for love. And I know some people give me a lot of stick about it. You know, like you mentioned right at the beginning of this, you know, I could have made money, I could have done this, I could have done that, but I didn't because if I wanted to make money, then the love comes out of it, I think. And you've got to be prepared to be mum, dad, auntie, uncle, anything that that kid loves or needs, you've got to be prepared, especially in a junior programme. I'm not talking about seniors, I'm talking about junior programme. You've got to be there for them. So if they're having problems out of basketball, you've got to be there to be able to listen to them. It might not be you, it might be another coach, but you've got, just got to be there for them. So if you're not prepared to do that extra bit, if all you want to do is come coach and do the games, then it's not going to happen. It's going to die. It will happen, but it, it won't last for long because the kids will go where, they, where they're going to get the love. Everybody needs a bit of love. But, um, and also... Your, your pockets have to be deep <laughs> because sometimes you're going to have to dig out of your pockets to keep your club running. You shouldn't have to, I know, and I've been told I shouldn't have to, but you do sometimes have to go into your pockets and not begrudgingly. You do it because you want to keep things running. What do you, you know, when you talk about the future of the club, let's say the next five five years, what are your hopes and aspirations, dreams? Like, where do you want the club to be? Uh, what do you want to achieve in the next five years, let's say? All right. Um, want to keep it going. Want want to get this venue. I want to get, I really do want to get this venue where it's just my club's venue. All right. That is one of my goals, to get a venue and leave something, my legacy, is I have a venue there and that anybody who wants to play basketball in East London or in the surrounding boroughs can come to this venue and it's just basketball. You know, if you want to come and scrimmage, you come there. You want to come play a match, you come there. And you don't have, I wouldn't charge you loads and loads of money. Uh, um, I'd want that. Um, I want the club to continue, to continue to grow. Um... I'd like to put back in my mini team because my mini team sort of like died away. So we've got in our under 14 conference team, even though we're not running it this year, we've got 10 year olds, you know, mini basketball players and that are playing under 14 conference. Um, I'd rather they play under 12s or under 11s and there are some central venue leagues that we do play them in um, but um, and we still will do but I'd rather come in, I'd, like, I'd like to have my mini basketball team back in but we then need lead on to more coaches and the coaches have to come in with that love for the sport I'd also like to get some more money in the club so that the coaches that are coming in I can give them some kind of money to cover them like their expenses their time so they're not coming in and doing it for nothing because not everybody's me all right some people that people do need money to survive all right I understand that and um but the coaches that come in you have to come in and have that that love in your heart that you're going to give those kids your time right not just come coach and then leave them all right it's very hard to get coaches like that, by the way. <laughs> um, there are some out there, but it's very hard to get them. Um, but I would like to give coaches some money. I mean, Stephen's been with me a long time, and I would so like to give him some kind of money for his time of him being with us. Um, we've had coaches come and go, but he's stuck around, and he's doing wonderful things. And most probably, no doubt, when I meet the great basketball player in the sky, hopefully he'll keep the club running. Hopefully. Hopefully the club will still be running when I go. Hopefully. I was going to say, when you talk about your own personal legacy, what do you want it to be? What do you want people to say about Caroline Charles uh, and kind of the impact that she's had and the things that she's done uh, with basketball? 
I came, I saw, and I gave everyone a chance. I, I came and I saw, and nobody was beyond my coaching. I doesn't matter what standard you are, okay? You came and you enjoyed playing basketball. You love playing basketball. I'm due, I'm due to do a reunion, right, and get all my players. Like we had one reunion when, way back when, right, and well, Kenrick came back for that one. But, um, I had a reunion, and we haven't had a reunion since. So we're due a reunion, and it would be awesome. Can you, can you imagine all those players coming back for my reunion? Oh my gosh, yeah, I'd, yeah, I came, you came, you saw, and I never let any of them go by the fall by the wayside. I, I gave them all my time. I, that's all I can think of. I don't blow my trumpet enough, and I wish I could, but it's. I don't know. I don't. People ask me why do I do it. You ask me why do I do it. I do it because I can, and I do it because I feel I need to do it. I, I just want to do it. I need to do it. I just need to give those kids another option, another option. Uh, I can't really answer your question properly, coherently. <laughs> when if I'm getting a bit emotional with that one because I, I never thought of it before. But yeah. No, that's that's uh that's perfect perfect place to finish. Um, Caroline, thank you so much uh for the taking the time, and also thank you so much for everything you've done for basketball uh, over the last you know thirty plus years. It is much appreciated. We need more people like you that are in it for the long haul, doing things consistently. Um, more, fem- more female coaches, come on. More female coaches, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I sincerely appreciate it, and um, wish you all the best for this season. Hopefully, we have a season. Hopefully, COVID uh, isn't too damaging, and um, I'm sure I will see you on the circuit at some point soon. Hopefully, hopefully. Bye, Sam. Thank you for this.